Welcome everyone, I'm Miriam Gray and I'm joining you live at the World Bank Group headquarters here in Washington, D.C. The focus of the spring meetings this year is investing in resilience and managing uncertainty, topics of critical relevance today as the war in Ukraine, COVID and climate change are generating unprecedented challenges. And while all countries will be affected, the effect on developing countries will be much worse, whether through higher food and energy prices, weakening economic prospects, or increasing climate impacts. Leaders from around the world are meeting here to discuss these impacts and to shape solutions that can build stronger, safer, and more prosperous communities. Today, we will be looking at what will it take to advance climate action, especially at the time of tightening fiscal constraints. What are the financing needs for climate smart future? How can resources be effectively leveraged? What kinds of capital can support specific low carbon resilient investments? And most importantly, how the climate and development agendas are connected so that working on one front also advances outcomes for the other and they really deliver for people and human well-being. And a reminder, we are streaming this event in English, Spanish, Arabic at live.worldbank.org. Let's take a look at what's coming up over the next hour. We have many interesting discussions coming up and to start the president of the World Bank Group, David Malpas, invited Her Excellency Shrimulyani Indrawati, Minister of Finance of Indonesia, to discuss issues around climate action, a topic they have frequently discussed together. Thank you very much, Miriam. Uh, well, I want to welcome everybody to today's discussion. It's a pleasure uh, to be here with Her Excellency Sri Mulyani Indrawati. She's the finance minister of Indonesia, and she's also a senior host within the G20 process this year. We're going to be discussing climate change uh, and also the big challenge uh, of development along with global public goods. So with that, thank you very much, Sri Mulyani, for, uh, for joining us. We spoke together last year, a year ago on this topic, and also at Glasgow at COP26. Uh, since then, and I'll give you a brief update, uh, the World Bank has uh, been implementing the Climate Change Action Plan, uh, which is based on integrating climate and development and directly recognizing the value of global public goods. We have much higher spending targets for the World Bank Group, and we're also uh, looking to have those uh, spending uh, and engagements with countries be as effective as possible. We're doing that through reports for, for countries around the world, CCDRs, that we think will be a, a powerful instrument to help uh, countries think about their own uh, engagement with both development and integrating it with climate. Around the world, we're working to lower greenhouse gas emissions. This is a challenging task and also carry out adaptation, uh, help countries with their preparations for climate changes. Uh, we're working in other areas of global public goods such as marine plastic and conservation, all of which take money from the world community 
and apply it to specific uh, uh, global public goods that are goals of the whole world community. Um, we now are faced with the war in Ukraine. Uh, it's having a, 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 a compounding effect on the cash flow, on uh, human tragedy uh, going on in Ukraine itself, uh, higher food and fertilizer uh, and energy prices around the world, which puts strain on budgets such as uh, the Indonesian uh, fiscal uh, budget, uh, and it's causing stress on top of the pandemic. We see that Europe uh, is changing in its thinking about some aspects of global public goods, including its, uh, its stance toward natural gas, which is an important source of energy, and nuclear power, also a, and a very important source of uh, a base load for electricity production. So those are some of the challenges that the world faces as a whole. Uh, and as we get specific then, uh, and I'll, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Finance Minister Mulyani, Sri Mulyani, um, how she thinks about the connection between financing of projects, which is, a, which is a challenge in itself and something that the World Bank is very well positioned to help with, but it's expensive and for the whole world community to be participating in the financing. Welcome, Minister Sri Mulyani, and I'll launch right in. I, I, I want to ask about coal, the coal transition in Indonesia. How can it be financed? What are some of the uh, problems you've encountered? What are some of the steps that the world needs to go through in order to help in the effort toward uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in Indonesia? Thanks for joining today. Thank you, President Malpas. It's really good to see you also. And I would like to congratulate you under your leadership. World Bank Group has been very, very good in responding many of the membership challenges, especially uh, related to the global public goods issue. First, the pandemic, which you responded very, very well and quickly to help many of the country in the world. And, and then also now related to the climate change. On the climate change, uh, Indonesia is a one country, but it's not a unique case. We have already uh, committed our, uh, what we call it, a national determined commitment to reduce our CO2. 29% of the CO2 reduction uh, with our own effort or 41% if uh, we are going to get the support from the international. So the question now, how we are going to impl implement this commitment? The biggest, the biggest contributor, uh, of course, uh, for Indonesia, two very important, for forestry as well as energy sector. And in energy sector, because Indonesia have a natural resource rich, we also rely very much on coal. So uh, currently, yeah, uh, energy uh, fuel mix is around more than 60%. So if we are going to reduce the CO2, which is coming from the energy, definitely we require to address this issue of coal. And at the same time, when the demand for energy is going to continue increase, then we have to be able to build replacement for the coal as well as uh, satisfying the new demand. Now, on the coal, which is related to how we are going to address the issue of coal, we are designing what we call the energy transition mechanism. But Indonesia, just like many other countries in the world, when we hit hard by the COVID, David, uh, actually, the demand for electricity declined. So at this very moment, when Indonesia already have uh, around 270 uh, gigawatt, uh, uh, the capacity of the energy, the demand is actually much lower than that. Around 20 gigawatt is excess supply. While the decision for us to build additional capacity in the past five years, has already created additional 13 gigawatt. So now if we are going to reduce the coal, that means we have to one, how we are going to retire the coal, which is already contracted. And in Indonesia, we have what we call it the individual power purchase by the private sector. So some of the power generator owned by PLN, our electricity company, which is state-owned, but also power generator, which is owned by the private sector, but they are contracting the energy to the PLN. 
this contract is usually a long-term contract, 20 to even 30, 30 years. So if you want to retire call, that means we have to reduce the length of contract. Currently, we've already identified five gigawatt of the coal power uh, energy, that is power generator, with the qualification of their old, and that's why the efficiency is low, and they are more polluted. So um, among all those uh, power sector, uh, power generator, which is uh, actually coming from coal, we've already identified. Now, to retire those coal, if it is owned by our own PLN, that is electricity company, you don't have to renegotiate the contract. This is just about retiring this old power generator, and then you have to replace with the renewable. But still, within this case, we have to make sure that the renewable energy is going to be efficient. Technology, as well as uh, in terms of financing, need to be secure. And that's why you need investment for the renewable energy. But for the retirement of the old coal power plant, which is belong to the private sector, then you have to renegotiate contract because the contract is already, this is a take or pay usually, we call it TOP, take or pay. And that's why we have to make sure that they are willing to then retire in terms of the length of the contract, the rest of the contract that will be reduced and then compensate it in a way that it can, cannot be seen as violating the contract. Because if you violate the contract, Indonesia have a very bad experience in which we are in an international tribunal and we lost the case. And that's not really good, uh, also not financially, but also reputation-wise. So for us to do the in energy transition mechanism, there are many uh, issues that need to be addressed. First, how you are going to renegotiate the contract with the power producer, independent power producer, in uh, what we call it uh, amicable way. That is going to be like accepted uh, through the, what you call it good practice. And then the second one, how you are going to compensate this contract that will be reduced in terms of the length. Uh, of their service and where the money is coming from to compensate that reduction, right? And at what price? Is it going to be like the secure price? Don't forget that sometimes uh, those coal can be also not really efficient. In the past, the contract can not really uh, seen as the best uh, interest for our PLN. Sometimes it's just too costly. 12 uh, cent per kilowatt hour or 10 cent, which is maybe sometimes the, the, the price can be actually much lower than that. So that kind of uh, situation that is on a technical level need to be addressed. And then the second one is where the money come from to retire this coal. And here we work uh, with the multilateral development bank. Uh, I appreciate with uh, World Bank, with the ADB, we are talking about what kind of structure which is, in this case, a doable. Not to mention, in this case, the consequence on the social environmental of this power plant with, that will be retired. Are they going to just like to become a sound capital, so abandoned capital that need to be also thinking about that. And then replacing with the renewable, we also need another capital spending for building the renewable energy. So for us, the question more about the location as well as the transmission distribution, because Indonesia is an island country, uh, uh, David. So you can, the demand mostly in Java, but you also need to build for the outer Java island, which is now growing very fast, like Sumatra and Kalimantan. So these are all have their own source of uh, renewable energy. Thank you for going through that. I think it's relevant uh, because so many countries face similar problems, whether that's Vietnam or Turkey or South Africa, of uh, their, the, uh, a dependence on coal, uh, on either coal imports or uh, coal itself. Uh, and and the uh, high value of it, it's gone up in value even now because of the rising energy costs around the world for other 
for other commodities. Um, so you used a, uh, in, in Glasgow, you used a large number for the cost or the, the, the uh, inflow of money that would be needed for this effort. One thing, uh, World Bank w w Group, uh, IFC and the World Bank uh, have been looking at is how to create a facility that would allow the coming together of funding sources from around the world and then focus it on a specific uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction project. We're at the point where we have to be concrete uh, in how to close a coal-fired power plant in South Africa or in Indonesia. Uh, and those proved to be really difficult challenges because of the uh, large cost and the long lifespan of the project. It takes years and years to wind down uh, the, the dependence on coal. Do, do you want to share your thinking on the, on the cost uh, or, or the number you used in Glasgow? Well, we are identifying in this case the total cost for uh, the reduction based on the, uh, the updated uh, before the COP26 in Glasgow, it's around 286 billion US dollar. Mostly is actually for the energy. We actually can have a much cheaper through the forestry. That's why we're then also supporting us on the mangrove uh, replanting. I think this is also one of the very potential for Indonesia. But energy definitely is the highest in this case, which is around 60% of the cost is coming for that. And uh, the question regarding uh, how we are going to structure this, first, uh, you're right. At this very moment when the coal price is even increased, at some point even uh, reaching more than 400 per ton, which is, I think, is uh, uh, relatively extremely high in this case. Now it's already going down again. But this is also for Indonesia, although we are among the biggest producer of coal in the world, we actually committed this coal for many of the export. That's why if we are going to compete with our own use for our own electricity, the Indonesia imposed what we call it domestic market obligation. So for the coal producer, they have to provide our own coal needs for our electricity before you can actually spend or uh, sell it to the foreign or international market. When the coal price is very high, at some point actually we were a, a little bit caught by, caught by surprise because suddenly the stock of coal domestically shrinking very fast. So we then turn around and making sure that there will be really a monitoring of the export of coal in Indonesia. These are big, big challenges. There's going to be a, a, a full discussion today in other panels of some of these issues. Uh, but the, the thing that strikes me is the, the, uh, the large cost, the complexity of the projects themselves, their long uh, duration, World Bank can help in structuring uh, or thinking about how to have commitments that last for years and years uh, between governments and their coal sector, for example. But this uh, core problem that you're mentioning right now, that the coal is either used in Indonesia or it's exported and burned somewhere else, that, propo that poses a, a itself a giant global public goods problem for the world of how do you, how do you lock in and how do you uh, avoid the ultimate use of those carbon holding uh, uh, products. Uh, and this is one that I think has to be tackled directly in terms of global public goods and the financing for it. But, yeah, thank you so much, uh, David. It is really a very important and challenging task for all country because I think when you talk about the global public good like climate change, this is not only about the idea or the intention, but most importantly, translating it into a very uh, workable, uh, both investment decision uh, and commitment. And in this case, what we call it affordable transition means that the access of capital need to be cheap enough to compensate this the very uh, costly capital commitment. And then also affordable in terms of uh, av availability of this financing. The World Bank is uh, in a very good place for you to become both the catalytic, but also financing side to be able to like using the World Bank Group, IFC, Viga, as well as IBRD or IDA. I think this is going to be one of the most important World Bank role in order to help many of the member country 
to be able to design a good and sound and credible transition on energy. Thank you so much. Th thank you very much. Back to you, Miriam. Walk on. I'm Charmaine Wright from Kingston, Jamaica, and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF Spring Meetings. Thank you, David and Sri Mulyani, for those insights and a really interesting update on what has specifically changed since they've connected last year on these issues. Please do share your thoughts on that discussion and those to come. You can post uh, your comments using the hashtag Finance for Climate and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and LinkedIn. And you can also post uh, comments and questions at live.wallbank.org. And that's where we have our experts standing by to answer your questions in English, Spanish, French and Arabic. Let's take a look at some of them. They're already busy at work. Uh, we will be putting some of the most popular questions to two World Bank experts at the end of today's event. So we are also inviting you to take part in our quiz challenge. The question we are asking today is how much investment needed each year to limit global warming, boost resilience and support a global transition to net zero emissions? Is it A, about $10 billion a year? B, about hundred billion dollars a year is it even more than that C is about one trillion dollars a year and the last option is D more than two trillion dollars a year you can cast your vote right now at live.wallbank.org and we'll bring you the results at the end of this event and before we go to our next discussion we ask one of our experts to help explain exactly how climate finance works let's take a look Each country is different. All need to address the climate crisis. How can we help piece together the right investments that can help countries meet both climate and development objectives? Climate finance is increasing, but not fast enough. Over the next decade, we need to mobilize trillions of dollars to give people access to resilient and reliable water, food, clean energy, mobility, health and education, and protection from disasters. First, spend smartly. Rethink inefficient subsidies and price carbon. Enforce construction standards, green supply chains, and improve procurement. And systematically screen for climate risks so that infrastructure is more resilient and cheaper to build and maintain. Next, get private capital flowing. Better data and national plans can help investors invest with confidence and ensure public and private resources complement each other. In some sectors, like clean energy or electric vehicles, the solutions are already here and largely competitive. Private investors can speed up their adoption so that scarce resources go to research and development in less mature areas like improving battery storage and supporting more vulnerable communities. In sectors like adaptation, private investment is lagging, so we need new instruments and business models to mobilize private capital to go where it's needed and reduce risks for investors. Multilateral development banks like the World Bank Group have a key role to play. We act as a bridge between governments and private investors using public finance to catalyze private capital. This is vital for developing countries where investment needs and climate risks are highest. Climate finance can also help carbon markets to monetize emissions reductions as well as more dedicated climate finance, including the 100 billion pledged under the Paris Agreement and concessional finance. Piece by piece, we can build the green, inclusive and resilient economies of the future. Hello, I'm Pirom Kov in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF Spring Meeting. As you just saw, financing climate action is about investing trillions of dollars. So let's find out a bit more about how the private sector is going to play a key role in driving this forward. Maktar Diop is the managing director of the International Finance Corporation. That is private sector arm of the World Bank Group. He's going to lead our next discussion on the role of private capital in supporting client action. 
His first guest is Rani al Mashat, Egypt's Minister for International Cooperation. Egypt will be hosting uh, COP27 later this year, and climate finance will be a critical issue. He will then drill down into how to mobilize private capital and accelerate financing with Rian Mari Thomas, chief executive of the Green Finance Institute, and Yves Perrier, chairman of the board of Amundi, one of the world's leading asset management companies. Hi, thank you, Miriam. It's, uh, it's uh, great to, to be able today to discuss about climate change. And we know that uh, there are uh, many solutions to help really uh, on fighting, in fighting climate change. Uh, and the money is not what is missing. Actually, I was recently talking to some people and I was explaining how much money there were in the capital market to support that effort. But we need to mobilize that money to find solutions, to find projects which are very useful for the private sector to invest, both in adaptation and mitigation. But all that, we will hear it from our panelists. And uh, here I'm here to start first with uh, Rania al mashat Minister of International Cooperation of Egypt. Uh, Madam Minister uh, Rania, it's a pleasure to have you today and thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, we know that uh, COP27 will be held in Africa and we're in Egypt. And you have a very big ambition for this COP27. Can you tell us quickly what you have in mind? Well, thank you very much. And absolutely a, a, a timely conversation on climate. Egypt's presidency is focusing on uh, three main uh, uh, messages. First, our impartiality, even though we are an African nation, but this is a COP for the world. So we're trying to maintain that. Second, uh, as you correctly mentioned, uh, adaptability, uh, adaptation and resilience, extremely important for many developing countries. And the latest uh, crisis we're seeing uh, uh, Ukraine, Russia has brought to the forefront again the importance of food security and everything that is related to that. Uh, and then third, uh, it's going to be what we hope is an implementation COP. So how can we move from the pledges to implementation and to action? So those are the three key messages uh, out uh, of Egypt and hopefully uh, to be materialized uh, next November in Sharm el Sheikh. But I Minister, mean, as you said, there were a lot of uh, pledges in COP26 and now we need, want to see execution. I know that energy transition is very high on your agenda. Water security and, uh, is another important part of your agenda, but also everything related to adaptation, which is sometimes a bit overlooked in the, the conversation. So tell us a little bit uh, what uh, the private sector can do to support all these priorities. Uh, you know, I, let me first acknowledge uh, IFC's important role in mobilizing private sector and uh, pushing private sector investments in countries. You know, COP aside, uh, the work that is being done uh, to actually uh, uh, engage private sector is important. In our case, uh, the energy transition uh, started uh, several years ago. Uh, and uh, when, we when we take a look at the integrated uh, sustainable uh, energy strategy, uh, that had very clear KPIs uh, for renewable energy uh, in the country. Uh, uh, the government did structural reforms which were very, very important to be able to crowd in private sector investments. And that is when uh, the IFC and many other institutions were also able uh, to bring in their investments uh, to support the energy transition. And this is uh, brought together a very successful project, the BIMBAM project, one of the biggest solar plants uh, uh, in the region. And these are examples that can be replicated in other countries as well. Uh, they uh, show uh, how different stakeholders can come together. Governments have a role to play in terms of regulatory and legislative reforms, uh, the uh, private sector's willingness, but also the IFIs, uh, whether in terms of financing or uh, technical capacity. Uh, so th these, are, these are examples that can be, uh, that can be replicated. Uh, in our case, uh, Egypt uh, has finished its 2050 climate strategy. And as you uh, correctly point out, uh, it includes uh, uh, the plans to move uh, to uh, our uh, NDCs by 2050 uh, across different sectors, be it agriculture, transportation, uh, uh, and many others. And uh, the idea of uh, the 2050 uh, uh, climate strategy is that it is not divorced from development. And that's why also with the World Bank Group, we are pushing, uh, we are one of the pilot countries with the uh, CCDR, uh, the Country Climate uh, Development Report, because we cannot uh, think about climate uh, as, uh, uh, you know, separate from the development process of the country. 
uh, and that's why there's a lot of integration between the different sectors and the different uh, and the different targets. Maybe let me just conclude by saying that, uh, given that uh, official development assistance is extremely important uh, for uh, different countries, in our case, the portfolio is quite sizable. We're talking about twenty-six billion dollars, uh, and uh, given the importance of SDGs uh, in the country's agenda. Uh, we mapped the official development assistance to SDGs. If we look at SDG number 13 related to climate action, uh, we find that there's $12 billion dedicated to that, 2.8 to adaptation, 7.8 to mitigation. You can see the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the imbalance. And I think the period ahead, what we want to do is to try and push further uh, the adaptation agenda. Now, that's great what you just said. You, raised, you talked about uh, regulation, you talk about a certain number of, of things that needs to be done. But one of the things that we're hearing very much from the private sector is green taxonomy. People want to know when they invest in a, uh, uh, to support a fight against climate change that is really targeted to activities which are related to that. So uh, what is your view about green taxonomy? Um, I think uh, yeah, it's absolutely correct. Uh, when, you know, the, the, the climate conversation is a multi-stakeholder conversation. Uh, it includes uh, governments, private sector, citizens, uh, as well as the international community. Uh, and that's why uh, it's very important from the government side to have a clear vision, to communicate it. Uh, and if there are any legislative impediments uh, for private sector engagement, try and address those. Uh, also, uh, very important are the innovative types of financing. And, uh, you know, one of the achievements of Glasgow uh, was uh, private sector uh, engagement was very, very high on the agenda. And we saw lots of commitments uh, from private uh, sector entities. And the point is now, how can we take these pledges uh, into implementation? And that requires uh, all of us working together to be able to create de-risking opportunities for the private sector uh, through innovative tools, blended tools, and so forth. And there's a wealth of experience, be it at the IFC, at EBRD, other institutions, uh, that have actually showcased uh, projects, whether mitigation or adaptation in emerging markets and middle income countries. And these are examples that we want to be able also to uh, showcase uh, and, uh, and replicate. And it also addresses the green taxonomy uh, that you just mentioned, because it gives uh, uh, comfort or confidence uh, that, uh, uh, you know, whatever target is set by the government and the private sector is able to come in, that that also is uh, uh, achievable. Now, thank you for very much. We, uh, if I can summarize a little bit our conversation, let me tell, you, tell me if I am getting it right. You said that you need a clear regulation. You need tax taxonomy. We need to have projects which are bankable. We need to create an environment where people are investing in adaptation as much as they invested in mitigation. And if, I hope that IFC will be your preferred partner in making it happen during the COP27. Do I get it right? Yes, I think, Mahtar, you, you, you summarized it very uh, nicely, uh, but I would just conclude by saying that uh, all stakeholders have a role to play and there is complementarity. The government needs to be clear and needs to be uh, uh, committed through taking uh, very important reforms uh, uh, in, in its own right. Uh, also, the uh, private sector needs to also show uh, its commitment and then the international community or the multilateral development banks and, of course, IFC, uh, uh, being a key partner on private sector engagement uh, also play a role. So I think it's, uh, uh, it's complementarity among uh, all stakeholders, but I believe that uh, all of us uh, are very much committed and climate is very high on everybody's agenda. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. It was a pleasure talking to you. A lot of food for thought. You raised a lot of points, adaptation, mitigation, the need to balance investment in all sectors, the need to bring some blended finance to de-risk investment. So let's now turn to two people who are actively involved in uh, mobilizing resources to fight climate change. We have Yves uh, Perrier, the chairman of Amundi, a large, long-term partner of IFC, which is, who is also the largest uh, uh, asset manager in Europe. I am also joined by Ryan Mary Thomas, who is the CEO of the Green Finance Institute, which is a think tank working on climate change-related issues. And both of them will tell us a bit more about their experience in mobilizing resources to finance the fight against climate change. Yves, uh, bonjour, because we are, we are in Paris, but uh, let's start and have that conversation. 
And uh, Amundi has a tremendous experience in, uh, in mobilizing resources. We've been working with uh, you at IFC for many, many years. And uh, really, when you're looking at people who are very experienced in the market, we're looking at you. What can you share from your experience with our people, with people who are listening to us today? Um, thank you, uh, Mektar. And uh, le let me start to, to thank you for uh, the strong uh, relationship uh, uh, that uh, we build between uh, Amundi and uh, uh, IFC. And um, especially, uh, we were uh, very uh, pleased and very committed uh, uh, to create uh, together uh, the Amundi uh, Planet uh, Ego uh, Fund, uh, which bring together public sectors and uh, private uh, investors. Uh, this kind of uh, initiative was part of uh, um, a global uh, uh, policy. We, we had the um, equivalent initiative uh, in Asia with uh, the Asian Investment Infrastructure Bank, uh, in uh, Europe uh, with uh, the uh, EIB uh, and also in France with the uh, Caisse des Depots. So uh, the two main lessons we, 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 we draw from this uh, experience is the first is uh, to be able to understand the subjective of uh, development financial institution uh, uh, as well as uh, the public sectors and uh, also the capacity to align them uh, with um, the needs of uh, institutional investors in their investment guideline. Second lesson is to share experience. With this partnership, we have built a unique experience and basis of uh, knowledge. Uh, we made this knowledge public and available to everyone. Thank you so much, Eve. Uh, uh, Rian, it was a nice uh, sharing a panel with you at Glasgow. Uh, you know, we, we talked about a lot about uh, capital mobilization, and I just came from Colombia where we launched the first green taxonomy. And I know that you are working on a lot of things which are of that nature to give more confidence to the private sector to invest. Tell us a little bit more about what you're doing. Uh, sure, and greetings from London, and thanks so much, Maktar, for uh, inviting me onto the panel today. Um, I think one of the things that we discussed in Glasgow was this point about the right kind of capital into the right kind of climate investment opportunities. And that really should be the tagline for financing the, the whole of the zero carbon transition. I think it, it really perfectly captures the task at hand, which is about creating the opportunities for finance providers to fund the transition in a way that meets their risk adjusted returns capital can flow. And those barriers can take many forms, as we know, but as we're talking about risk and rewards, let's focus on possible solutions to removing financial barriers. And you've kindly invited me to give an example of the work that we've been doing. And I'd love to share an anecdote about the work that we've been doing in South Africa with the South African banks and the investors. The banks there are facing a specific barrier, which is that the deep pools of pension capital in South Africa need to invest in investment grade securities such as a government bonds and so that often exempts them from investing in much needed energy waste and water infrastructure in response to climate change so by providing a de-risking facility that would partially guarantee the debt needed to fund those transactions the banks would be able to provide finance at competitive rates and tenors confident that they could then syndicate that to local domestic pension and institutional funds. So we've developed a novel green finance guarantee fund with partners in the UK and in South Africa that can provide that de-risking. And also importantly, we've structured that fund so that it would include government funding, development bank funding and private capital all deployed together so that each type of finance provider receives the returns that they're seeking in line with their mandate. And a key aspect of this anecdote that might surprise some of our viewers is that in the course of developing this fund, we uncovered over a billion pounds worth of climate smart infrastructure projects that the banks would consider funding if only they had the benefit of this guarantee solution. So just finally, the reason I'm particularly excited about this project is um, that whilst South Africa is the perfect jurisdiction for a proof of concept such as this, it's an entirely replicable solution in other countries. And 
So if we can identify the situations where with some de-risking, we can crowd in private capital, we're not only leveraging scarce government balance sheet in those transactions, we're also freeing up government development capital for those situations where it's more challenging to create a commercial case. So for example, to fund certain adaptation measures, but then that's a whole other topic for us to discuss. No, thank you very much, uh, Ryan. It's, uh, it's very interesting when you come back to the emerging economies and the roles they can play in, uh, in mobilizing re uh, resources because most of the resources are uh, uh, so far uh, mobilized from uh, more advanced economies. But uh, let me turn now to Pierre before coming back to you and uh, ask a question about platforms. I know that people want to reduce the transaction costs, so they don't want to repeat the, the, uh, all the work done for a transaction. They just want to have a standard term sheet. Uh, tell us a little bit what, is, what you think about innovative platforms and how the role it can play in mobilizing more resources. Well, uh, what is very positive is that uh, in the recent period, in the last three or five years, uh, there has been a, a commitment of uh, the whole finance industry uh, towards uh, this question of uh, climate. Uh, one very important point uh, uh, for this question is to consider that it's an industrial revolution at the level of the planet. We need to change uh, the energy supply going from 80% for size, which is the situation, to nearly uh, uh, zero percent, uh, but also to change the products, to change the way we manufacture the products, the chain of value. And uh, to be successful, uh, this uh, revolution uh, will need a strong alignment of public policy uh, and uh, private um, investors and uh, uh, of uh, uh, corporate uh, and and it has to be done integrating the question of uh, security of uh, supply and the present context recalls this importance also uh, the question of relative competitiveness and the so social impact uh, which will be uh, very important uh, and uh, so I, I think that uh, should emphasize on the coherence on all the criteria, of course, the impact of climate, but also social uh, impact. And that's the reason why we are very happy to have been selected by uh, IFC for the management and fundraising of the SEED uh, program. And uh, this is consistent in the what has been uh, always the policy of Amundi, uh, which is to have a holistic view of this question of uh, uh, responsible investment since the creation uh, of the company 10 years ago. Now, thank you very much. And um, you, you raise a lot of, of points which are actually uh, uh, connected to the points that uh, Ryan Mary mentioned. And uh, you said something quite interesting, Ryan, uh, earlier. You insisted on what needs to be done in emerging economies. And you, 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 you gave some examples. You talk about South Africa. And I'm sure that you have some other countries in mind. So what will it take today if we want to mobilize more resources from emerging ec economies? Especially, I think that there will be a lot of sensitivity to what just, uh, Eve just uh, said about social bonds, linking environment with social inclusion. So tell me what you think about that. <laughs> I'd be happy to. I think as a, as a broad comment, I'd say, you know, this is, is really a challenge of leadership and collaboration. And, and it's across all economies, as Eve just said, and not only emerging markets. And, you know, whilst I mentioned earlier a financial mechanism that channels government capital efficiently alongside development and private capital, in order to create lending and um, investment opportunities for local banks and investors, we, but we can't solve for a one and a half degree aligned world purely through financial instruments. We clearly need that enabling policy and regulatory frameworks in country, as well as the mechanisms to improve credit worthiness so that we can secure both local and international funds. Um, and as implied in your question, 
that they need to be led in country by those who have a, a really detailed understanding of local conditions. And that's where organizations like the IFC, you've got 16 years of experience financing opportunities in emerging markets and developing economies. You have such an important role in continuing to familiarize both local and international mainstream finance institutions with the opportunity for commercial investments and helping overcome perceptions of risk. For example, very practically pointing at your historic default rates. Um, so our research has also identified green banks as highly efficient vehicles in country to channel domestic capital, both public and private capital towards climate smart projects. And I guess finally, you know, there are no intellectually coherent high carbon pathways to prosperity. The science and the recent IPCC report has been very, very clear on this. So building these collaborative initiatives and these institutions that involve policymakers, industry experts, and financiers is absolutely key. It's a very interesting to hear it uh, say by someone who's scientist by training you. Uh, a lot of people really don't know it, but you are scientists by training. So saying that it's uh, not an exact science, but we need to put together institution so that people can work and create uh, this social contract that mobilize everybody around the, these targets. But you have uh, also said something quite interesting, is that uh, we need to de-risk, we need to have partnership, public and private needs to work together. But there is something I haven't heard a lot about, which seems to be coming more and more into conversation, is that maybe more investment in efficiency. We're talking about climate fighting against climate change uh, by reducing emission. And uh, uh, hearing people going to COP27, increasingly I hear people talking about uh, reducing the waste in, in, uh, in networks, uh, in uh, electricity network, reducing the, the leakages in, in water pipes, uh, reducing all these efficient inefficiency that we, we have. What is your take on that? Well, I fully agree with you here in uh, at the Green Finance Institute. One of our flagship pro projects has been looking at the efficient energy efficiency of buildings, which, uh, you know, here in the UK, our building stock accounts for about a quarter of our emissions. And this is clearly a, a, a topic that really resonates with consumers. It resonates with the electorate. Um, but finding ways of financing that upfront capital expenditure that then enables people to have lower energy bills. Um, and so, and the same analogy in industry where you invest the capex upfront in, lower, in order to have the lower operating expenditure ongoing. Um, these are real challenges that again, needs financiers to be working closely with regulators, policymakers in order to actually um, accelerate all of this. I, couldn't agree more with your emphasis on this is about both supply and demand. It's about efficiency. It's about using resources well and efficiently, as well as looking at our sources of demand and having you know, more reliance on renewable energies and uh, climate smart infra. Now, thank you so much, Eve. I know that in France, this is one of the priorities of the government to reduce, uh, to improve efficiency in household in the houses, in the uh, heating systems. And uh, do you see a platform being built around that to be able to mobilize the resources for cli uh, to fight climate change? Efficiency uh, is a main uh, uh, challenge. Um, and it's a main challenge because we have uh, to be uh, realistic. It will need a lot of time to transform the economy, to change uh, the energy supply. And when I look at the 10 years uh, to come, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, the way to reduce emission, the most efficient way is uh, through uh, energy uh, efficiency. And it needs uh, to align uh, uh, corporates uh, and the financial sector to finance this. And, uh, um, uh, in Amundi, we have built a joint venture, for example, with uh, EDF, which is a public uh, uh, energy utility of France, uh, in order to finance uh, this uh, uh, energy uh, efficiency uh, uh, investment. And we can imagine also uh, to issue uh, bonds uh, with index uh, about this, 
uh, where we share uh, the value of uh, um, the, uh, the reduction of the consumption of uh, electricity, of energy, uh, between uh, the utility, the consumers, and the investors. That's great. You know, I look forward to seeing both of you face to face, I hope this time, in Paris and London, and pursue that conversation. And uh, I, I would love to be able to organize something uh, during COP27 where we can have that conversation and bring investors uh, uh, face to face with uh, the, the capital market to be able to, to do more of what we are already doing. So thank you so very much for joining us. It was a pleasure having you uh, in this panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye. Namaste. I'm Shilpa in New Delhi, and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF Spring Meetings. Thank you to Maktar Diop and his guests for this insightful conversation. Next, we will be joined by Mari Pangesto, Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships at the World Bank and her guest, Lord Nicholas Stern, IG Patel, Professor of Economics and Government at London School of Economics. This forward-looking conversation will focus on how to make climate finance tangible and action-oriented. We just heard a, a discussion about the challenges around climate and development from how uh, we can integrate climate and development and in the case of uh, just energy transition, how can we have just an affordable energy transition at the same time uh, phase out coal. And of course, the big challenge of financing the scale of transformative investments that's needed for developing countries. In this discussion, we want to take a little bit of a forward look and I am joined by my good friend, uh, Lord Nick Stern, uh, who is also uh, uh, serving uh, with, with me and uh, the IMF on uh, the uh, high-level advisory uh, group on sustainable and inclusive recovery and growth. And of course, he is a well-known uh, climate and development expert. So Nick, uh, if I can just start our uh, discussion today by uh, asking you a very big question, uh, which is around climate and development. Uh, we know uh, the IPCC report has once again raised the urgency of the climate crisis, but developing countries are facing development challenges accentuated by COVID-19 and now with the Ukraine war. How can we really integrate climate and development and how can we uh, really scale up the financing that's needed? Thank you, Mari, and thank you very much for your leadership. The IPCC report is clear and strong. Each one that comes through is more worrying than the one that came before as the evidence accumulates and accumulates. We're headed for something closer to three degrees than two degrees. We haven't been at three degrees for three million years. The sea levels would be 10 to 20 meters higher, threatening our coastal cities and, uh, and habitations in a very deep and difficult way. We uh, would risk extreme events, which would, together with those um, long onset stories, would push hundreds of millions, perhaps billions to move. Let's be very clear about the scale of the risks and that we have to act very quickly and strongly, starting now in this decade, in, if we are to be able to handle those risks in a way that could be acceptable. And poor people, of course, are hit earliest and hardest. So what do we have to do? Well, we have to invest strongly in doing things differently. What things? Particularly the energy sector. We have to put in place a big transition and we have to do it now, and of course, uh, exiting coal, moving away from coal, absolutely core part of that. It's the lowest hanging fruit. And that will involve a great deal of investment. But we're going to have to adapt also as we do this. And we're going to have to invest in our natural capital as well. Fortunately, if we put all those things together, the investment in emissions reductions and the new energy story, if we uh, adapt, if we invest in our natural capital, we have a new model of development much more attractive than the dirty, destructive one that went before. We have cities where we can move and breathe, much more efficient use of all our resources, ecosystems which are robust and fruitful. It's a new model of development and it's in our hands, but we have to invest to get there. How much? Well, in emerging markets and developing economies, perhaps $1.5 to $2 trillion a year extra by 2030. 
perfectly possible from the point of view of world macro and past historical rates of investment, but a major increase in investment. And uh, that $1.5 to $2 trillion a year in uh, 2030 or by 2030 would have to be financed domestically and uh, internationally, perhaps internationally, something close to a trillion dollars a year extra. Big majority private sector, but that will be enabled by public sector resources which come, or financial resources which come with it and combine together. We have to reduce share manage risk in a way that allows the private sector to come in and brings down the cost of capital. And clearly the MDBs have a crucial role. So also the bilaterals with their concessional finance. And of course, the philanthropies, which although they'll be smaller in scale, can reach the parts that others can't reach. And they're the just transition and investing in people and places who were intensive in fossil fuels. That can play an important part as well, as could voluntary carbon markets. Uh, thanks thanks for that uh, very sobering but realistic picture, but also identifying the opportunities. Another uh, realism uh, that we are facing today is, of course, the Ukraine uh, war uh, and its impact on uh, high energy prices and increased concerns around energy security. You identified uh, energy transition as one of the really urgent uh, areas that we have to discuss. How can you, how, when you see the, the drivers that are ha happening now, how, can, how do you see us moving forward uh, if we, we want to still continue to accelerate energy transition? Well, energy security is very important and we've seen it in the past in the crises of the 1970s and the right thing to do is to move away faster and harder from fossil fuels and to increase strongly energy efficiency. Actually now our options for moving harder and faster away from fossil fuels are much bigger than they were in the 1970s because renewables and storage have proceeded so strongly. So that's the strategy. The implementation of the strategy means, of course, um, recasting energy supply. It means much bigger uh, capacity for electricity because so much of this story is going to be around electricity in terms of, of course, power itself, in terms of transportation, in terms of heating homes and so on. So we have to invest on the supply side and we have to encourage the demand side so it moves towards electrification and, of course, much greater energy efficiency. So that's the delivery challenge. How do we get that to move? The right kind of policies have to be put in place, including abolition of fossil fuel subsidies, the advancement of carbon pricing, but clarity on timescales for decentralization of the grid, clarity on timescales for stopping the sale of uh, internal combustion engine vehicles and so on. Making sure that the sense of direction is clear in those ways, but also enabling uh, in a much more efficient way the solution of problems and difficulties that ine inevitably arise as we move into uh, delivery. And of course, reforming domestic financial systems and getting the flows of finance right, as I described just now. That's the essence of what we call the country platform approach. And through its uh, climate change development reviews, I do believe that the uh, World Bank is moving in a positive way in that direction. Thanks, uh, Nick. I think the reality is we may still see a little bit of a slowdown, uh, but at the same time, uh, we hope that uh, accelerating energy transition is actually part of energy security, as you emphasize, or really, really part, a complementary part uh, of energy security. Now, let's uh, take a more forward look. Uh, we are uh, uh, heading now uh, into the COP27. It just happens the, the chair uh, this year is Egypt, uh, which is a developing country. So it's really a really good opportunity to look at how can we really deliver on climate and development. Uh, and as we heard from uh, Minister Rania earlier, uh, they are focusing on implementation as well as uh, on adaptation uh, and resilience. And the big question out there, which is the financing. Uh, I was in Egypt uh, recently 
uh, and uh, I was very encouraged to see the commitment of the Egyptian government uh, on the climate agenda uh, and their preparations for the COP27. So if I can ask you to take a kind of a forward look and see what are some of the ideas uh, that we can take forward to help uh, think through the delivery uh, on implementation and the actions uh, that uh, can really uh, integrate the climate and development agenda and then deliver on it, especially the financing side. And you might, if you could say a little bit more about the private sector, that would be uh, the role of the private sector, that would really also be really uh, helpful. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mari. We're looking forward very much to the leadership in COP26 of Egypt, and they really are, as you know from your visit, Mari, putting in place what's necessary. And they're emphasizing that this is a delivery COP. COP26 was very good in setting a roadmap, setting the targets, the private sector involvement, the commitment to net zero, the rising uh, place of um, adaptation, natural capital, and uh, so on. But COP27 is the delivery COP, and that is very clear with our Egyptian uh, friends and in their leadership. And of course, it's an African COP. In the priorities that we see on that delivery, surely the energy transition is um, very clearly there as one of the key priorities. Adaptation and resilience, we've seen how devastating climate change can be already with us, and it's going to get more difficult. So adaptation and resilience would be a second important uh, priority. Integrating, of course, adaptation resilience with emissions reductions as we can through decentralized solar, through public transport, through mangrove, mangroves and so on. We can put mitigation adaptation development together and we must. And of course, finance. I've already indicated the scale of finance that we need. It's going to be critical to advance of commitment, advance of ambition. So in that finance story, the um, private finance is going to be at center stage, but it will require reduction of risk, sharing of risk, management of risk. And in that story, then the combination with the bilaterals and the concessional money they can bring, the MDBs with the lower cost of capital and the skills they can bring and the management of risk are going to be enormously important, as will the philanthropies and the voluntary carbon markets. Second part of delivery is getting behind those countries which are already making strong moves and putting their country platforms in place. I think particularly of South Africa, which has worked so hard to get its clear plan for transforming the economy in place. But other countries too, Indonesia and India and Vietnam are all moving uh, very strongly. So countries that are coming forward, those are just examples, but other countries that are coming forward, we have to get behind them in the delivery story to show in those specific cases that the world is ready to get behind uh, their investments. And that means a combination of public sector and private sector in the management sharing and a reduction of risk that will be critical to bringing down the cost of capital. Thanks a lot, Nick. I think uh, my two takeaways from that is getting behind countries and supporting them to come up uh, with the enabling environment for uh, funding to come in and uh, the climate change and development reports that we are preparing, this is going to be part of the, of the support we're giving. And you, you heard uh, Minister Rania mention that specifically in the case of Egypt. And then second, how do we uh, have uh, different sources of funding, public and most importantly private, because the large amount of funding is gonna have to come from private sector. I think this is uh, our uh, home, collective homework, uh, the international community, as well as working with uh, countries, because it has to be country led and country owned uh, to really uh, put together the financing that's needed, whether it's the energy transition or whether it's the adaptation and resilience. So thanks again, uh, Nick. Uh, uh, the, the process is going to continue and we look forward to continued conversations with you and our work with the HLAG. Uh, uh, let me thank you, everybody, uh, and also now uh, give it back to Miriam. Now, people have been sharing their thoughts on this event online and on social media. I'm now joined by my friend and colleague, Sri Sridhar, uh, who's been following uh, this conversation throughout. So Sri, tell us what stood out for you. Thanks, Miriam, and great to see you. So we have people joining us from all over the world today, again, including India, Nigeria, Kenya, Venezuela, Spain, the United Kingdom, 
France, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, and also the United States. And they're, of course, using the hashtag for today's event, which is Finance for Climate. And they're joining us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, as well as Instagram. And they're talking about the need for climate action and how the private sector and green investments are needed to make communities more resilient to climate change. So why don't we take a look at some of the comments that have been coming in on our social channels. First on Twitter, we've got Wambi Peter from Uganda saying that a sustainable future requires large scale, low carbon investments that can help communities build a long lasting resilience. We next have a comment coming up on LinkedIn from Tomi who says that getting to net zero will not be easy or without cost and will need to go hand in hand with other objectives like economic development and increasing energy access. And finally, a comment coming in on our Facebook channel from Tamba in Sierra Leone who says that a huge amount of money can enable change, but until we learn to control our activities to avoid environmental degradation, this issue can and will always call for more funds. So it's, it's really great to see all this engagement coming in on our channels. Great, uh, thank you. And I think this is where the drum roll should come in. Yes. Because I understand you have uh, the result of our quiz. Yes, so we have a quiz today which asks how much investment is needed each year to limit global warming, boost resilience, and support global transition to net zero emissions. Our four options here are A, is it about $10 billion a year? B, about $100 billion a year? C, about a trillion dollars a year? Or D, is it more than that? Is it more than $2 trillion a year? So there is a right or wrong answer. Before we get to that, Miriam, what do you think the answer is? I was going to go with C, about $1 trillion a year. Okay, well, shall we see what the results are? And just to know, we had nearly 2,000 people take part in today's quiz. So you'll see here 11% think that it's about $10 billion a year. 29% think about $100 billion a year. 28% about a trillion dollars a year. And finally, most people think it, with 32% think that it's D, more than $2 trillion a year. And guess what, Miriam, they're right. D is the right answer. Well, the numbers uh, really, really do uh, add up. Thank you Here's so me. much, Sri. Thank Thanks, you, Miriam. thank you for joining us. Hi, I'm David in Switzerland, and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF Spring Minis. August Kuame, country director for the World Bank in Turkey, and Hania Dawood, uh, who is a manager in the climate business department at IFC, have joined me here in the World Bank atrium. And in a moment, they are going to be answering some of the questions you've been asking. But first, let's recap the main points we've heard in the past hour on how we can finance effective climate action. So we have heard that addressing climate change and development together is a complex exercise that needs to go from high-level commitment to real tangible action. For the low carbon resilient transition, the world needs large scale investments. Financing this transition will require continued uh, create enabling environments, leverage different pools of capital and ensure that affected communities have a voice. Okay, now let's uh, hear from August and Hania. Welcome and thank you for joining us live. And my first question will be to both of you. So this is probably one of the most voted questions from the audience, um, and it is how can we institutionalize climate action? Let's go to August first. Thank you, Miriam. Well, first, let me start by saying that climate action and development are intertwined. In fact, there is symbiosis and synergy between the two. So it makes full sense to institutionalize climate change when we talk about development. We know that uh, development without climate change action can push up to 132 million people into poverty, in addition to the several hundreds of millions of people who are already poor today. We also know that good climate action can actually create development, growth, and poverty reduction. So at the country level, what, it may, what does it mean to institutionalize? What we think is that when governments are planning their development and their growth and the poverty reduction strategies, climate change should be at the heart of it. And when they're planning actions across government, they, should look, they can look at it from the climate change angle so that 
There is a whole of government approach. There is an economy-wide approach to climate change. At the bank level, what we're trying to do is, as you have seen, the new climate change action plan put climate change at the heart of the bank work at the same level as poverty reduction and inclusion and equity. So we're going beyond the project approach to looking at climate as a country strategy, uh, in the country strategy as a, a program approach. The bank has also introduced the uh, climate, uh, country climate development report, the CCDR, which is uh, a core diagnostic that allows us to help work with countries without us flying blind. So we, it gives us an understanding of the country's climate change and development uh, issues in, a, in an integrated fashion. So we can help countries not only in, uh, implement good program, but also upgrade the NDCs, the nationally determined contribution, help them prepare long-term strategies to achieve net zero, help countries boost their capacity to be more uh, resilient to climate change, make their population and their economies more resilient, therefore support their adaptation agenda. What it also means at the global level is we know that no single country can address climate change alone. It is everybody's business. It is every country's business. So there is also an opportunity here to institutionalize climate change in international cooperation, in international development. Uh, so when countries are helping each other, when we're all helping the world address big issues such as COVID-19 or the impact of the war in Ukraine or high inflation today, we do that with climate at the climate change at the heart of the action so that we don't solve a problem whilst creating another one for the future generations. Thank you, Augustin. Let me take it to Hania. So Hania, now what does the private sector has to offer and how the private sector can help to institutionalize uh, climate action? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Um, climate change is a collective action problem on, on steroids and, and climate action is a global public good. As August said, governments and nations need to come together, the private sector needs to act, and we have a role as individuals to play. So I agree with everything that August said. I will add three more things. One, what gets measured gets done. Data about emissions is integral, about the baseline of emissions and about the traje trajectory of emissions. This is important at both the country level and at the uh, company level. Why is that? If we know which sectors and which subsectors contribute most to climate change. If we know what part of a company's value uh, chain is responsible for climate change, we can prioritize action and we can concretely identify areas and where we need to channel money. Secondly, commitments matter and what gets committed to gets done. We're seeing countries commit to ambitious NDCs, the private sector at an unprecedented level is committing to net zero targets, which is extremely exciting. And for us here at the World Bank, we increased our commitment to 35% uh, of our climate, of our entire commitments towards climate action and to also align with the Paris Agreement. Now, commitments are great, but what really matters is to operationalize these commitments and to come up with concrete plans and move from rhetoric to action. My third point is our votes um, matter. It's really inspiring to see the youth engaged in this debate. This holds policymakers and the private sector accountable. Shareholders are also voting with their dollars and are demanding that companies and their investments do what's right for action. What's great is that much of this is already in, in, in play and in progress, but what is really needed is to move from, ambitious, from ambition to action and to really start to, to operationalize and make concrete plans. Thank you. Uh, so our next question is from Eswatini. Temba Tawala has actually sent us a video. Let's take a listen. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Temba Tawala. I'm from the kingdom of Eswatini. Um, I think my question is, how can developing countries uh, like 
is what is informally known as Swaziland, struggle between tackling immediate problems like abject poverty and climate change. Um, how do we ensure that our efforts are actually effective and efficient, uh, and also balancing uh, between development and also reducing climate change? Well, a great question from uh, Temba Tawala, and uh, let me just repeat it. How can uh, countries balance climate action and development challenges? Let's go to August first. Well, thank you very much, Temba, for this question. Uh, it is very clear that the poorest countries are the most impacted by climate change. And unfortunately, they contributed the least to the causes of climate change today. They contributed the least to CO2 emissions. And within countries, the poorest are actually suffering the most. Um, however, uh, countries, regardless of their level of development today, uh, do not have the option of addressing development in a high carbon intensity way and postponing actions that will increase the adaptation or resilience to the impact of climate change. It has to be done jointly. Um, the, the, the good news is that now the tension that we used to see between development and climate change are disappearing. First, because the cost of adopting technologies that are greener has gone down. And therefore, uh, it is possible to actually find development solutions that are affordable whilst being totally consistent with climate change. Uh, second, when we have also learned that when countries take climate action to increase their adaptation and their resilience, this also creates growth. It creates poverty reduction. It is very inclusive. Since we know that the impact of lack of adaptation is worse for the poor, when you invest in adaptation, you're actually implementing inclusive and progressive policies that benefit the poorest the most. We also know that the international community is now committed more to climate change and developing countries are receiving support financially from developed countries. So these financing, if packaged well together, can actually reorient a lot of the development financing toward climate action. Uh, let me give you an example of how a country can take one portion of development activity and transform it into a climate action both for mitigation and, ad and adaptation. Take forestry in Turkey, the country where I work. Forestry, we know, is a carbon, forest is a carbon sink. It helps the mitigation agenda. It helps absorb CO2 from the air. So when you invest in forestry, you're actually investing in mitigation. You're also investing in adaptation because forestry can help uh, reduce landslides. It can help retain soil. It can help make the poor less vulnerable. You also, by doing that, you're also doing development because you're creating jobs uh, in the forest sector. Uh, you're creating opportunities for the rural sector. You're also investing in food. As we saw today, the impact of the war in Ukraine can put, can put a lot of pressure on prices because of lack of or, or reduced supply of food. So when you invest in forestry, you can also increase uh, the potential of the agricultural sector to help address these kind of uh, food, food scarcity. So just one example to show that poverty reduction, development and growth is not contradictory, it's not orthogonal to climate change. In fact, the two go together. Our advice is countries should can think of climate action as actually development. When you're doing climate action, you're doing development. What, if you want to do poverty reduction, do it through climate action. Right. Thank you. Okay, so my next question is uh, for Hania. How can private companies tackle both poverty, uh, both poverty and climate? Yeah, it's such an important question. And it's such an important question because, you know, as August said, the world's poorest countries are the most impacted by climate change uh, by form of you know, hurricanes, flooding, uh, but they contribute least to it. So. At the same time, it's integral to integrate climate and development. We need to continue to invest in economies and their private sectors to continue to create jobs, to continue to create jobs. So what is the role of the private sector? It's to create jobs, 
and it's to innovate. The IEA estimates that 30 million jobs can be created by 2030 just as part of the energy transition. Innovation. The private sector needs to drive innovation. It needs to drive innovation in, for example, climate smart solutions focusing on the agribusiness sectors that help farmers improve their fertilization, um, their irrigation techniques. Uh, the private sector can drive innovations in technologies that help with better weather patternings and, Im and satellite imaging so that information is disseminated quickly to the world's poorest so that they can act, act faster. And then lastly, the private sector can invest in natural capital, which form the basis of ecosystems that also um, are integral to, to the poor. Thank you so much for joining us live today. Thank you for coming. And if you have any comments on the spring meetings, you can share them using hashtag resilient future. Finally, as, uh, as this, it is now a tradition at these events, we asked our Connect for Climate colleagues to share with us what young activists, students and champions want to see happen on this agenda. C4C was on the ground at MENA Climate Week and hear what they heard about people, what young people looking uh, to change on climate action at COP27 in November. We're very happy Egypt is going to be leading uh, the COP27 uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh in November. COP27 is the opportunity to go from declaration to implementation. COP27, it's our chance to revisiting the ambition and filling the gap. COP27 is our chance for the Middle East countries to enhance their climate action. To uplift the region that has been neglected, to show that we are implementers of the Paris Agreement. Now it's about mobilizing finance, because we need trillions. It's not about billions. This year it's taking place in Egypt, so we have to make sure that emerging markets are well represented. We cannot possibly solve global climate change without creating the right environment for capital to move towards the emerging markets. For the trillions to make uh, their way on the ground, uh, we need to be able uh, to decipher what we mean by de-risking and blended instruments. So we look forward to working with all our partners to see how we can actually move from commitments to implementation. At COP27, we need to get much more granular about solutions to the needs of the most vulnerable communities. We need accountability at COP27. We need to ensure collective action at COP27 because this determines the life of my generation, future generations. It is important that all the parties um, get to join the conversation. It includes not just private sector and civil society and governments and uh, multilateral development banks, but youth are extremely important in this equation. In COP27, I really hope that young people will be more involved. Youth have to be at the center of this kind of implementation. The youth engagement, we have to take it to the next level. Trusting us, that's worth it. We want to prove that in the COP27 because young people are our region's greatest resource. On the road to COP27, we need the youth because whatever we do today for COP27 and COP28 will be for them. We'll be working tirelessly to make sure that as many young people as possible will be trained and prepared to meaningfully participate and collaborate with the parties and governments at COP. We look forward to welcoming all of you in Sharm el-Sheikh. Young climate activists demand action and inspire hope. Climate change impacts everyone, but the future belongs to young people. And it is great to meet some of the young activists on the front lines. And you can rewatch this event as well as previous ones on the potential of the digital revolution and discussion between the leaders of the World Bank Group and IMF on responding to global shocks. Stay with us um, all week for more high-level discussions on the most pressing challenges in development today. Tomorrow we will be bringing you two more events. The first is about rising fragility and then we'll be focusing on how to preserve open trade. And we will be wrapping up these meetings on Saturday by exploring how can we reverse the losses in human capital. You can watch all of that at live.wallbank.org. Thank you for being with us today. We hope you enjoyed this program. We really wanted to bring you different perspectives, tangible solutions that are helping us to finance climate action for green, resilient 
and inclusive future. Goodbye for now.